Rudy Valley requests your attention for the Royal Gelatin Hour with Fanny Bryce, Kalula Bankhead, and Joe Laurie Jr. Everybody, this is Rudy Valley and Company. The hilarious Fanny Bryce, the orchidaceous Tallulah Bankhead, the droll Joe Laurie. There's a trio that you can count on for a good time. Fanny brings her little Hellcat, Baby Snooks, to an Eastern microphone for the last time before leaving for Hollywood on a new screen contract. Tallulah will be heard in a new play by Dorothy Parker. And Joe continues on his novel way for the fourth consecutive week. In addition to these professional entertainers, we have with us an amateur of high standing in the community, New York Town's best-known and best-liked host, Frank Case, proprietor of the celebrated Algonquin Hotel. We're so proud of our people this week that I'm going to ask Graham to run through the list again. Graham, if you will. We have with us this evening Frank Case, Joe Laurie Jr., Sammy Bryce, Tallulah Bankhead, in a play by Dorothy Parker. These springtime nights, birthday parties and bridal parties bring requests for birthday tunes and nuptial anthems. And for birthdays, here's what we play each evening. If it's your birthday today, this is for you. It's somebody's birthday. For it's somebody's birthday, the first time on earth. Time to be happy and gay. This delightful occasion is in celebration of years as they pass away. So with music and flowers, we'll spend happy hours. We'll sing and we'll dance and we'll play. Let's all drink a toast to our most charming host. For it's somebody's birthday many people like Joe Laurie Jr. is this. He sounds like such a nice little guy, if you'll pardon the vernacular. And the reason he sounds that way, strangely enough, is because he is such a nice little guy. Moreover, his stuff is different, refreshingly so. Quite away from the ordinary run of the mine radio material, for example, the tall tale he has for us tonight. Enter Joseph Jr. wearing his customary cigar. Thanks, Judy, thanks. Uh, say, did you hear about me getting stuck up? Only four times in the program and you're getting stuck up already. <laughs> I never would have believed it of you, Joe. <laughs> no, Rudy, I'm, I'm in a real stick-up, you see? I was out kind of late last night and I was walking along minding my own business and the first thing I know, there was a gun stuck in my face and a very tough guy says, stick up your hands. And what did you do? What did I do? I just gave him a good talk it. I said to him, say, hey, wait a minute, why should I stick up my hands for you? You're a perfect stranger to me. You had him there. Yeah, and was his face red? He was what they call nonplussed. You see, Rudy, I just didn't like the way he said it. You know, stick up your hands. That's no way to talk. Impolite, I call it. That's the way it hit me, too. 
Now, could you have been nice about it and said in a gentlemanly way, stick up your hands, please? <laughs> then I might have put them up for him, even though I have a touch of neuritis in my bad shoulder. And by the way, Rudy, I think I'm going to get cured of that neuritis. How, Joe? Well, I found a doctor that knows all about it. He's had it himself for 20 years. Go on about the holdup, Joe. Well, I told that guy plenty. I said to him, see him, mister. You know you wouldn't do this if there was a cop around. And you know all I got to do is to call a cop and you'd be arrested? Now, I bet you haven't even got a license to carry that gun. Would you believe it, Rudy? He didn't. No. Cross my heart, Rudy. He didn't ha- even have a license. So you see, I could have got him in wrong there. Then I said, uh, let's talk this thing over, buddy. Now, when you told me to stick my hands up, you were going to go through my pockets, weren't you? Well, that's an old trick. And besides, that's my wife's job. <laughs> and why should you pick on me when there's lots of other guys that have more dough than I have? Then I said, uh, you know, you ain't going to get anywhere doing this kind of business. Did you ever hear of anyone in your profession getting on top? And he had to admit I was right. And another thing I said, supposing I hadn't come along, then what would you have done? <laughs> at that, you came near missing me. I was supposed to be over in Jersey tonight at the clam <laughs> And another thing, supposing I was on the other side of the street, then what would you have done? Well, Rudy, you had no answer. So I just gave him a cold look and walked away from him without even saying goodbye. Just like that. Just like that, Rudy. And did he feel foolish standing there all alone with a gun in his hand? <laughs> well, while I was walking away, I got to thinking things over and I got kind of mad. So I went back to him. See here, I says, I'm not through with this yet. You got me good and sore. You know, I had to meet my wife and I'm late, and it's all your fault. What am I going to tell her now? You don't think I'd be a sap and tell her I was stuck up? I couldn't get away with that old one because I've told her some good ones, see? <laughs> Here you've been taking up my good time, and what do I get for it? I'm a citizen, and I pay taxes. And I'll bet that's more than you do. Why, you haven't even got a social security card. <laughs> Whatever got you in this business anyway? Well, Rudy, by this time I had the guy crying. And he says, listen, fella, don't bore me out. I'm just one of them unfortunate guys that got started in life wrong. Then I said, I suppose you're going to tell me your father was a stick-up man. No, he said. I had the finest father in the world. And what started you, I said. Then, Rudy, that big guy stood there bawling like a kid with a gun in his hand. And what do you think he said? What did he say? He said, Santa Claus started me. <laughs> no kidding. Well, by the look I gave him, he must have known I didn't believe him. No kidding, he says. You see, every Christmas I'd hang up my stocking and Santa Claus would bring me a toy gun. One Christmas, when my father was working, Santa brought me a machine gun. No real bullets or nothing. My old man wasn't that rich. And I got to playing with guns even when I grew up. Then when I got of age, I got a funny sickness. I could eat well, sleep well, but I had no desire to work. <laughs> you see, I'd like to sleep all day, and when night came, for some reason I just couldn't sleep. So I walked around the streets all night. Then I figured, why waste my time walking around doing nothing? Why not pick up a few bucks here and there? So I took this gun that I had over the house and that I only used on the 4th of July and figured it would do the gun some good to get a little exercise, too. So you see, I kind of wandered into this racket. Well, by this time, Rudy, he had me crying. Listen, I said to him, why don't you get yourself a nice little wife and settle down? Why, I already got a wife, he says, and she's the sweetest little woman in the world. Listen, buddy... Would you believe it? The day after we were married, she went out and got a job. It was tough on me having to stay home by myself, but I made that sacrifice. <laughs> Every night I'd sit on the stoop and wait for her to come. When I'd see her coming out of the subway, I'd run to meet her. And I'd say to her, gee, honey, you look tired. Let me carry your pocketbook for you. <laughs> you see, mister, I got character. Well, Rudy, he hung his head. He had one of them heads that looked well hung. Be careful, Joe. You'll have me crying. <laughs> well, it is kind of touching, isn't it, Rudy? Well, he hung his head and sort of swung it from side to side in a very sad, puzzled way. Buddy, he said, I'm sorry I ever met you tonight. You got me so nervous I wouldn't be any good to work again for weeks. You know, I had a date with my wife tonight, too. What am I going to tell her? I can't say I went to see a double feature because she knows nobody stays to see a double feature. And by the way, young fella, you hit a sore spot when you said I didn't have a social security card. What does this look like? A ticket to the Schmelling Braddock fight? Well, Rudy, he showed me his social security card. And he had a low number, too. You know, it made me feel sort of, well, sort of foolish. So we stood there looking at each other for a minute or so, saying nothing. 
and finally kind of break up the monotony. I says, you'll never make a success in this business. You don't know the first thing about it. Now tell me, why did you hold me up on a lighted street? And he said, can I help it if I'm afraid of the dark? <laughs> well, with that, I get kind of disgusted and says, oh, you make me sick. You don't even know the right time. And do you know, Rudy, he didn't? You see, uh, I had his watch. <laughs> so long, Rudy. I'll be seeing you. Now your grocer is featuring two of America's most popular desserts, delicious royal chocolate pudding and creamy, rich royal vanilla pudding. These warm days when cooling and refreshing desserts are so welcome to everyone, you'll want to have royal vanilla pudding often. For besides being a delicious cold pudding, royal vanilla pudding makes marvelous homemade vanilla ice cream at very small cost. As you know, royal vanilla pudding itself tastes very much like rich vanilla ice cream. You can easily make your cooked royal vanilla pudding into real ice cream by just freezing it with a little cream and sugar in your automatic refrigerator or a pail of salt and ice. You'll find simple, easy directions on every package. And whether it's frozen into ice cream or just served as pudding, royal vanilla pudding is an ideal dessert for children, for it's made with wholesome arrowroot. And now, for a limited time only, royal vanilla pudding and royal chocolate pudding are being featured at your grocer's. Take advantage of this special occasion and get a good supply of these delicious puddings. The convenient, economical way to buy them is to get three packages at a time. Buy three packages of genuine royal pudding from your grocer tomorrow. Mmm, that's pretty bad, isn't it? Sort of sour. Mmm, well, after that, nothing matters, does it? It's a thing that one cannot explain But it's like a long draft of champagne To awaken perchance to the world of La France Where only the river is sane It's a matter of learning to live That old ladies would never forgive It's plain to see, sunshine is free 
Now is the time for lovey when all the trees are green, so green, and all the grass is green, so green, and all the frogs and flies are green. It is the spring. Asparagus is green, so green, and most of us are green, so green. The smoke room joke, let's keep it clean, is green, so green. And when you meet a girl, you need not ask her pardon. Just say, if your name's Maud, please come into my garden. When trees and flowers and grass are green, and life's a joke, see what I mean. It's no surprise to realize that I'm so green. Hello, where are you going to, my pretty maid? Oh, I say, I'm frightfully sorry, sir. I had no idea. It's so difficult to tell these days, isn't it? The sprouts and leeks are green, so green. The old cabbage is green, so green. And figs and beans and plums and cress are green, so green. Traffic stop when it is green. Says there's no cop, my dear old bean. Go right ahead, you're all serene and green, so green. <whistles> Fetch me a glass of buttermilk quickly, please. <clears throat> if uh, if we were betting any money on who was going to play Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Our wager would go down on Tallulah Bankhead. That's not a tip, it's just a strong hunch. Based on the fact that movie producers occasionally show good sense nowadays. To provide Tallulah with a play tonight, we have dramatized a short story by Dorothy Parker called Advice to the Little Peyton Girl. The adapter, Hilda Lawrence. With Miss Bankhead, you will hear Miss Florida Freebus, who plays the aforesaid Little Peyton Girl. This is Tallulah Bankhead in a Dorothy Parker play. <laughs> Miss Marion's eyes were sweet and steady beneath her folded honey-colored hair. Miss Marion's drawing room was all pale, clear colors and dark, satiny surfaces. And low light slanted through parchment. In that dim sanctuary, you would never have guessed that Miss Marion had been weeping just before the little Peyton girl came to call in the afternoon. Everything was so hushed, so soothing, so sure. Before she had quite decided to do it, the little Peyton girl spoke out. Are you sure you don't mind if I talk to you, Miss Marion? You look sort of tired. No, darling, I'm all right. What do you want to talk about, Sylvia? Oh, Miss Marion, I need your advice. I'm in an awful fix, and I don't know what to do. Oh, Sylvia, that sounds like heart trouble. Well, suppose you tell me all about it. Oh, I knew you'd listen. I knew you'd understand. Miss Marion, do you know what it's like to be in love? I can probably imagine, darling. Go on. Well, it's Fred Barkley. You see, it isn't as if we'd actually had a quarrel. We've just sort of drifted apart. And I haven't seen him for two weeks. Then you can't bear it, and you wish you were dead. Is that it? Yes. Do you love him that much, Sylvia? Well, I... Oh, yes, I... Well, it's so awful without him. We used to see each other every day, every single day. And he'd always telephone me when he got home, even if he'd just left me ten minutes before. And he'd always call me as soon as he woke up to say good morning every day. Oh, you don't know how lovely it was. Yes, I do, Sylvia, I know. And then it stopped, just suddenly stopped, didn't it? Yes. What made it stop, Sylvia? What did you do? Well, one night after he'd gone home, he didn't telephone me. I waited and waited. It was awful. You wouldn't think it would matter that much, would you? But it did. Yes, I know it did. 
It does. I couldn't sleep. I got to thinking that maybe he'd gone to see somebody else after he left me. And I just couldn't stand it, so I called him up. Yes, of course, you called him up. How old are you, Sylvia? Nineteen, aren't you, darling? Yes. Well, I've seen women of 30 make just the same mistakes. Tell me, was he at home when you called him? Yes. He'd been asleep, and he wasn't very nice about it. I asked him why he hadn't called, and he said it was because he didn't have anything to say. I asked him if he'd been out with somebody else, and he said no. I didn't believe him, so I cried. Did he hear you cry? Yes, he... He, he had... hung up on you, didn't yes. he, Sylvia? So I called him back. Called him back? Oh, darling, why? Well, I thought I'd lost him. What else could I have done? Well, you could have used bloodhounds. <laughs> go on, well, go I, on. I had to find out. I kept asking him if anything was the matter, and he kept saying no and acting cooler and cooler as if he didn't love me anymore. And then... And then he started going around with another girl. How did you guess? Oh, I'm awfully good at guessing things. I can probably guess a few things about the other girl, too. She's pretty awful, isn't she, Sylvia? She's terrible. Yeah, of course she is. Do you know her, Miss Mary? No, darling, I don't know her, but I do know this. No man ever leaves us for a finer woman. You just ask any girl you know, and she'll be glad to tell you that she lost her man to a girl who was a perfect fright. <laughs> Listen, Sylvia, you didn't tell the Barclay boy that you didn't like this uh, new menace, did you? Why, uh, yes. Oh, baby child, that was wrong. Never, never point out another man's woman's imperfections to a man. You ought to know that. I couldn't help it. No, I suppose you couldn't. But it didn't help matters much, did it? It only made him stay away more and more, didn't it, Sylvia? Yes. And he called you up less and less. Yes. And then when you did see him, you were so nervous and so worried that you couldn't think of anything to say or do. Yes. Yes. And you kept asking him if anything was the matter. And he kept saying, no, of course not. <laughs> Why should there be anything the matter? But he stayed away more than ever, and you began to be afraid of losing him altogether. Right, Sylvia? Yes, that's right. Sylvia, did you let him see that you were afraid of losing him? Well, I... I told him in a laughing sort of way that I knew he'd thrown me over for somebody else. But it's the truth. I haven't seen him now for two whole weeks. And I can't stand Oh, him. don't cry, Sylvia. Don't, don't cry, darling. What did I do that was wrong, Miss Marion? Tell me. What did I do that was wrong? Well, you shouldn't have talked to him about throwing you over. You see, men don't like dismal predictions, Sylvia. Oh, I know the Barclay boy is only 20, but all men are the same age, always. And they all hate the same things. Oh, I wish I were like you, Miss Marion. I wish I always knew what to do. No, oh, thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia, I want you to forget about this boy. You can, you know, if you try. But I don't want to. Oh, couldn't I just call him up just once more and try to talk things over? No, no. Men don't like to talk things over. They hate straightening things out. When you see the Barclay boy again, Sylvia, treat him just as if you'd been laughing together with him an hour before. Oh, but maybe I'll never see him again. I've called and called, and his mother always says he's out. That woman hates me. Oh, of course she doesn't hate you, darling. You just think she does. In times like this, it's very easy to think the world is hostile. That's part of the disease. Oh, Miss Marion, do you think he'll ever come back to me? Why, of course he will, Sylvia, but you've got to leave him alone. Well, I'll do anything you say. Then no more telephone calls. Oh. No matter what happens, no matter how much you long to hear his voice, keep away from the telephone. Oh. If he calls you, darling, that's fine, but you must never, never call him again. But, uh, if you do, you'll think you're pursuing him. You won't like that, you know. Never let a man know how important he is to you. You've done that already, and it was a mistake, but you needn't make the same mistake twice. Well, I should think men would like to know how much a girl loves them. They should, but they don't. <laughs> they like to be kept guessing. And Sylvia, above all things, don't ever let him know he's made you unhappy. Well, I'll try. But I'm afraid... You must conquer your fears, dear child. A woman in fear for her love can never do right. Realize that there are times he will want to be away from you. Never ask him why or where. No man will bear that. Don't predict unhappiness nor foresee a parting. He'll not slip away if you don't let him see that you're holding him. Sylvia, love it like quicksilver in the hand. Leave the fingers open and it stays in the palm. Clutch it and it darts away. Be above all things always calm. Never in this world make him feel guilty, no matter what he's done. He doesn't call you when he said he would, or if he's late for an appointment with you, don't refer to it. Make him feel that all is well always. He's sweet and gay, but Sylvia always, always calm. And trust him, Sylvia. He's not deliberately hurting you, my sweet. He never will unless you suggest it. Trust yourself, too. 
Don't let yourself become insecure. I know it sounds unkind, darling, to remind you that there are always others. When I know that he's the only one you want. But you're very hot and soft, Sylvia. And he's not to know that he's the son and there's no life without him. He must never know that again. It's a long way, Sylvia, and it's a hard one. And you must watch every step you take along it. But it's the only way with a man. Well, it isn't easy, is it? But if it'll work, I... It always has, dear. Miss Marion, I think you're the most wonderful woman I ever knew. You've made it all so clear. Do you know what? What, Sylvia? From now on, I'm going to try to be like you. Oh, like me? Yes, you're so wise and so sweet. Why, you never get yourself in a mess like this. You always know the right thing to do. Well, I've had several years more in which to practice than you, darling. Now, run along, Sylvia, and for heaven's sakes, keep away from the telephone. Now, that's rule one. I will. Oh, I will. (laughs) Maddie. Maddie? Yes, miss? Take Miss Sylvia to the door, will you? Then come back here. Yes, I'm this way, miss. Oh, don't bother, Maddie. I can find my way, all right. Goodbye, Miss Marion. Goodbye. Thanks a million times. You're... You're wonderful. <laughs> Good luck, darling. Goodbye. Goodbye. Silly kids, Maddie. When will they ever learn? I wonder if they know how funny they are. Of course they don't. And in spite of everything I've said, she'll go right out of here and throw herself at his head. Yes, ma'am. I gave them very good advice, Maddie. But I'm afraid she won't take it. <laughs> she probably thinks I'm a fool and don't know what I'm talking about. Well, she'll learn. Yes, um, girls is funny that way. What time do you want your dinner, miss? Dinner? Well, I don't think... Uh, well, I don't know, Maddie. I, I uh, may be dining out tonight. Uh, Maddie, any messages come while I was out this morning? No, nobody called at all. You sure? Yes. I didn't leave the house a minute. Nobody called at all. Well, that's funny. Maybe maybe the phone's out of order, Maddie. Yes, sir. Maybe he called and you didn't hear him, Maddie. Well, I'll just try him once more. I'll pretend I've been out all day and say I thought I might have missed him, too. If I make my voice sound so sort of casual, do you think, Maddie? Uh, hello? Uh, Mr. Lawrence, please. Oh, he isn't. Is uh, this his secretary speaking? Yes, but I called yesterday and left a message. It was very urgent. Uh, did you tell him? You did. I see. Well, if he, um, um, uh, if he comes in again, just tell him I, uh, uh, tell him that I called, will you please? Thank you so much. She's lying, Matty. She didn't tell him. That woman hates me. <laughs> I can tell it by a voice. Of course she's lying. He wouldn't do a thing like this to me, Matty. Maybe, maybe he's at the club, Matty. I'll try the club. Maybe he got tired of the club and couldn't come. Um, um, uh, hello? Tennis club? I- is Mr. Lawrence there, please? Oh, I see. Oh, uh, when did you last see him? When was he last there? Oh, no, no, thank you. There's no message. Uh, unless you tell him when he comes back that... Well, oh, no, never mind. That's all right. I'll call again. Thank you. He was there all the time. I didn't want to talk to me, Maddie. I know it. He was standing right by the phone and laughing. I could hear somebody laughing. Oh, I'm going crazy. He wouldn't do that to me, Maddie. Not to me. He said he wasn't angry, you know. He said everything was all right. That's Maddie's sick. And that fool secretary won't tell me I'll kill that woman. I'll get the office again and I'll make her tell the truth. He said there wasn't anything the matter. He said he'd call me when he could. I, uh, hello? <laughs> oh, this is Miss Marion again. I'm awfully sorry to trouble you, but, um, uh, well, I thought that maybe I, <laughs> well, I hate to be so persistent, but are you sure you gave my messages to, uh, oh, I see. He's gone abroad. Oh, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> now, wasn't that just like a woman? Our thanks, Miss Bankhead and Miss Freebus. The Royal Gelatin Hour claims your ears for some more minutes of this hour and bids for your further attention with Fanny Bryce and Frank Case of the Algonquin. Act Two opens with our June Brides medley, arranged at the request of some hundreds of June Brides, bridegrooms, best men, bridesmaids, ushers, papas, mamas, and disappointed suitors, all assembled for party purposes at the Astor Roof. Gentlemen, to the bride.
sorts of people to make a town like ours, this New York. One of the very best sort is our guest of honor this evening, Mr. Frank Case, proprietor of the Algonquin Hotel here in Manhattan. Mr. Case represents the finest flower of that night and day blooming species, the innkeeper or Boniface. It is with pride that we add him to our gallery of folks you ought to know. His hostelry, which he loves as if it were his only child, has long been a meeting place for important personalities of the stage, the pictures, and the book publishing world. As a result, Mr. Case meets even more interesting people than we do, which is saying quite a lot. May I present New York's best-known host, Frank Case. Rudy, that introduction was a honey. Only if you, got, you forgot to mention that the Algonquin Hotel is located on 44th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue. The room will buy $3 a day and up. Basket parties welcome. Sure. And every third drink on the house. But seriously, Rudy, what interests you about the hotel business? Well, let's see. How is the hotel business? Fine, Rudy, fine. Hotel business is always just dandy in New York during the hot summer months. Only the other night, one of our guests came downstairs shortly after midnight to check out. What's the matter, asked the clerk on the desk. Something wrong? No, nothing wrong, said the guest. Only the night watchman's gone home, and I'm afraid to stay upstairs alone. I see. Business is great. But you do still have quite a few important people staying at your house, don't you? Oh, yes. They wander in and out. Your Mr. Tallulah Bankhead, for example, is frequently one of our girls. There's a grand person for you, Rudy. I met her when she first came to New York. She hadn't yet been on a stage, hadn't seen a manager, hadn't yet lost her Alabama accent. But she was determined to go places in the theater. Mr. Case, she said, do you think I ought to change my name? I told her I didn't think she should. Why, I asked, why do you want to change such a beautiful name? Well, Mr. Case, she said, I'm afraid it's pretty long to go up in electric lights over a theater... Two years later, her name was up in lights. She knew what she wanted. And still does. I understand a great many Hollywood stars put up at your place when in town, Frank. Yes, we do get our share. But literary people are currently our specialty. Novelists, playwrights, publishers, strange folk of that sort. You must hear some pretty interesting talk, Mr. Case. Well, yes. But may I qualify that statement by saying that writers do not exactly drip pearls of thought in my direction... For instance, sitting at lunch with Edna Ferber, after a rather long silence, I said to her, say something wonderful, Edna. And she said, if I could think of something wonderful, I shouldn't waste it on you. I'd go home and, I'd go home and write it. Well, here's something I meant to ask before. How did you happen to go into the hotel business? When I was a boy in Buffalo, Rudy, there were two very well-dressed gentlemen in town who seemed to do nothing but ride around in an open hack and go to ball games every afternoon. When I asked who they were, I was told they're hotel keepers. So I decided that was what I wanted to be. <laughs> and did you find that the life of a hotel keeper really did consist of riding around in an open hack and going to ball games all afternoon? Yes. Of course, I did have to serve an apprenticeship before I reached the hack and ball game stage. I went to work as night clerk at the Genesee Hotel in Buffalo. A night clerk, Rudy, is supposed to stay wide awake all night. In more ways than one. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I couldn't do it, but I finally solved the problem by wearing roller skates. We had a beautiful marble floor, and I skated around all night. If you ever want to stay awake, Rudy, try roller skating. It works. I'll remember that, Frank. Tell me this. Do people steal towels from the Algonquin? <laughs> oh, Yes. And other things, too. For instance, there's the case of the celebrated actor, a very good friend of mine. He is supposed to change the name of his yacht to the Algonquin. Because that, that was easier than filing the name off all the silverware. <laughs> Do you steal hotel towels, Rudy? Well, not recently. I, I used to have one marked Hotel Taft, New Haven, but that happened quite a few years ago. I have quite a collection, personally, Inclu <laughs> including a rare old 1912 Palmer house with embroidered pansies. <laughs> you know, I'm more of a soap snatcher myself, Frank. I still have six cakes of soap off the Ile de France and five out of the Savoy Hotel in England. 
Well, soap is nice to collect and easy to get away with. But towels last longer. If you know anybody that has a 1926 Waldorf Astoria, I'll trade him two Park Centrals for it. I'll inquire among my friends at the Friars Club. Say, uh... How about skipping, Frank? Do many people leave your hotel without paying up, and what's the best way to do it? For you to do it? <laughs> For you to do it, you mean? Well, no, not exactly. I was thinking more of the boys in the band. What's the matter? Don't you pay them? <laughs> yes, but you know, they're, they're naturally restless, always looking for bargains, you know, real boys at heart. I see. Well, I wouldn't know, Rody. We don't have much trouble with skippers. If a man can't pay his bill, he usually tells me. He pays me later. Of course, there are a few heels who get away with things. <laughs> but eventually, as time goes by, they all get caught. What I always say is, time wounds all heels. What was that? <laughs> what was that? Time wounds all heels. It's fun. <laughs> oh. Seriously, Frank, what, in your opinion, constitutes a good hotel? A good hotel, Rudy, is simply a place where one can get a good night's rest and good food. It's small, in my opinion. Eminently quiet, friendly, respectable, with complete service at reasonable cost. Of course, Rudy, a hotel like that might not appeal to the boys in the band. They might prefer something a little more, well, uh... Fortissimo? Yes, a little more fortissimo. Like the hotel I heard about once that had only two rules. Two rules? What were the rules? No opium smoking in the elevators. <laughs> and guests will kindly bury their own dead. <laughs> so long, Rudy, and thanks for the use of the hall. Thank you, Frank. See you at lunch. Wellington's Caravan.
Ask a woman about desserts right now, and she'll say... Well, naturally, with warm weather here, I like desserts I can make in my refrigerator. Cool, refreshing ones like royal chocolate pudding. Yes, royal chocolate pudding is a grand summer dessert. And have you tried making homemade ice cream with royal chocolate pudding? No, but I've heard it's marvelous. It certainly is. And next time you want some extra delicious homemade ice cream, just freeze some cooked royal chocolate pudding with a little sugar and cream. It's very easy. And you can make marvelous vanilla ice cream, too, with royal vanilla pudding. Just follow the directions on every package. Use your automatic refrigerator or pack it in a pail of ice and salt. And don't forget that royal gelatin is another cooling dessert you make right in your refrigerator. In royal gelatin, you get the flavor of real fruit, of juicy, rich strawberries, cherries, raspberries, and those cooling tropical fruits, lemons, oranges, limes, and pineapples. Right now, your grocer is featuring delicious royal chocolate pudding and smooth, creamy royal vanilla pudding. Desserts that are mocking tomorrow. R-O-Y-A-L. She taught me the meaning of we we sherry, so we danced the night away from the Montmartre to the quay. How we sang the Marseille. She was Mademoiselle from Armentier, and I was the Duke of the Rue de la Paix. I met her in Paris at the Cafe du Dome. She was such fun, and I was so far from home. She's only a Yankee. From Gulf, Tennessee Now she sherry me months ago, the movies became sensible and signed up Sophie Tucker. And now they have persuaded Fanny Bryce to exchange Broadway for the swimming pool in the eucalyptus country. The producers, MGM, have our congratulations. Fanny celebrates her imminent departure for the cinema coast with a final eastern fling with baby snooks, that terrible talk that she popularized on the air. She is assisted tonight by the veteran Teddy Bergman. Enter Fanny Bryce as Baby Snooks. Scene, the home of baby Snooks. It is evening. Snooks is preparing her homeward, uh, homework for tomorrow. Her father is politely inquisitive. Now, Snooks, tell me, what do you have to do for homework today? A composition. A composition? You have to write a composition on what? On how I spent the day at home. Well, let me see what you wrote. Here, Daddy. This is a composition on how you spent the day? Why, it's a blank sheet of paper with nothing on it. Oh, I didn't do nothing all day. Snooks, why did you spend the whole day doing nothing? Because I wanted to be a good little girl. I don't understand that at all. You could be a good little girl and still do something. No, I can't. Why not? Because every time I do something... Something breaks. Well, you can't hand in a blank piece of paper for your composition. Now, you tell me all the things you did today. I'll write them down in the composition, and then you can copy it. Mm. <laughs> Mama, you will have to copy it. Why should Mother have to copy my composition for you? Because the teacher thinks that's my handwriting. 
<laughs> Snooks, you have no pride in your education. I'm ashamed of the way Mother and I have to do your schoolwork for you. Snooks, I suffer a great deal because of you. Well, I suffer on account of you too, Daddy. Why? Because all the examples you do for me is wrong. <laughs> Let's not go into that, Snooks. Now we'll start the composition. You dictate, and I'll write. Now, how did you spend the day at home? Well, I... Must I tell the truth? Well, of course, nothing but the truth. All right. I woke up in the morning and had breakfast. Didn't you wash your face? No, nope, I saved it from yesterday. <laughs> Well, I think you better say you washed. Well, it ain't the truth. Pick a day when you did wash. The teacher wants it from this week. I'll take that up with you later, Snooks. Now go on with your composition. What did you do after breakfast? I waited, and I waited, and I waited. You waited for what? For lunch. <laughs> What did you do after lunch? I waited some more. What for? Your dinner? No, for my four o'clock milk. You can't write a composition just about eating all day. Who can? You! <laughs> you should tell something about what happened. All right. Daddy and Mommy was fighting all day. Now, just a minute. You can't write a thing like that. Because you'll give the wrong impression. You'll make people think your parents fight all the time. And you know that Daddy loves Mommy. Not today. He didn't. <laughs> that was a very special case about a new dress your mother bought. Let's continue with the composition. And remember, you can't say Daddy was fighting with Mommy. All right. Mommy was fighting with Daddy all day. I won't allow it. You mustn't write a thing like that. All right. You write the composition. All right. After breakfast, I rode on a nice new horsey Daddy bought me. Why horsey? <laughs> now, Snooks, it's just a make-believe horsey for the composition. Now, after you rode on the horsey, what happened? Daddy was fighting with Mommy all day. What? Yeah, throwing dishes. Now, you know that's not true. What dishes? Just make-believe dishes for the composition. Snooks, I don't want you to mention Daddy or Mommy again in connection with your composition. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Now, what happened after breakfast? A lady and a man was fighting all day. I don't want to hear any more about that fight. Just tell me what happened to you. Huh? Weren't you sent on some errand? Didn't you do something? Oh, yeah. Mommy sent me to the grocery store. Mommy sent it you? Yeah, and I went it. Sent it and went it. What kind of talk is that? When you're writing a composition, you can't talk like that. You must use your very best English. All right. Now dictate it exactly as you want me to write it in the composition in your very best English. All right. After breakfast, I is went to the grocery store. No, no, you can't say that. Don't you know anything about tense? Is is the present tense, was is the past tense. Oh, I was went to the grocery store. No, no, the correct thing to say is I went to the grocery store. You didn't, I went. I know you went, but the right thing to say is I went, understand? Did we both went? No, 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 I didn't go, you went. Now say it. You went. Not you went, I went. That's what I said, you went. When I say I went, I don't mean I went, I mean you went. <laughs> Do you feel all right, Daddy? I feel as well as I can under the circumstances. Now, let's go on with the composition. All right. Now, what happened after you returned from the grocery store? Well, Daddy and Mommy... Max! I told you not to mention that again. Well, I don't like the composition. Now, this is too much. Snooks, you're a very naughty girl, and you're backward in your schoolwork. There's only one way I can see any hope for you. You'll have to pray to the angels every night to make you a good girl. I pray to the angels, Daddy. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Did you pray last night? Mm-hmm. But it's no use. What do you mean, it's no use? The angels didn't listen to me. You prayed to the angels last night and they didn't listen to you? Mm-hmm. How do you know they didn't listen to you? Because today the school was still open. <laughs> Since warm weather started, millions of women have been using royal chocolate pudding in two ways. They serve it as cool, delicious pudding, and they freeze it into fine, smooth, homemade ice cream. One of these women says... I always knew that royal chocolate pudding by itself was a delicious, cold dessert. 
And then one day, I noticed an ice cream recipe on the package. It sounded so easy, I made some. How'd it turn out? It was marvelous. In fact, my children said it was the best chocolate ice cream they ever tasted. And, of course, it saved me a lot of money, too. Yes, royal chocolate pudding is wonderful for making delicious homemade ice cream. You can use an automatic refrigerator or a pail of ice and salt. It's very easy. You'll find complete directions on every package. Royal chocolate pudding, you know, is the rich-tasting chocolate pudding that's fine for children because it's made with wholesome arrowroot. Arrowroot keeps your pudding smooth, cooks fast. And so you can make royal chocolate pudding in only five minutes instead of 20. Right now, your grocer is specially featuring royal chocolate and royal vanilla pudding. Try these cooling, refreshing desserts. Buy three packages of royal pudding tomorrow. R-O-Y-A-L, royal pudding. Green, prevented by illness from appearing tonight, will be with us next week, we hope, along with a fine cast headed by Dennis King. This is Rudy Valley saying good night. Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.